Hello everyone, this is Rufus Opus, and today I have a very special uh, thing that we're doing today. We're um, Yesterday I sat down with Maggie Caldwell. She's the latest instructor to join us at AcademiaHermetica.com. She's going to be giving a class on February 28th at 4 p.m. Eastern. It's uh, a 90-minute class. Um, it's a, sort of like a TED Talk on um, dream analysis and augury. Uh, again, that was February 28th. In the video itself that's coming up in the interview, I gave the wrong date. Um, please note that it is February 28th at uh, 4 p.m. Eastern, so it should be plenty of time for everybody to be able to dial in. I think that's a good time to host national conference kind of things or class things that are going to go around the world. Anyway, um, check out the video. Uh, we get to talking about uh, our history together a little bit and... Um, uh, how she ended up in dream work and, and what the course is going to be about. So, uh, yep, it's a quick one. Again, February 28th, not February 27th. All right. Thanks a lot, guys. Hi, and welcome to Applied Hermetics with Rufus Opus. This is Rufus Opus, and today we have a special guest, Maggie Colwell. Colwell. Of course, I said it wrong. <laughs> um, I had practiced that, of course. But uh, yeah, so Maggie is the latest new addition at Academia Hermetica. She's going to be teaching classes on dream work and Carl Jung and uh, creativity. And her first course is going to be launching at the end of the month on February 27th. It's going to be a 90 minute presentation on dreams, their, um, the meaning of dreams, science, and augury. It'll start on February 28th. At four o'clock, it's a 90 minute presentation on dreams and it's gonna be $25 uh, for, uh, per, per person, big Zoom chat. And um, yeah, so welcome, welcome to the show, Maggie. Appreciate you coming on. Thank you, Rufus. I'm excited to uh, be joining Academia Hermetica. Yeah, we, we've known each other since like 2013, I guess, in person. And, yeah, and it was online before that, too. Yeah, yeah. So we, we've got a long history going back. You, you, were, um, you were teaching at Crucible. Uh, I don't remember what the course was, something about Kabbalah and witchcraft or? Yeah, it was probably um, something about the 27th path, path as a uh, balance of order and ecstasy. Um, <laughs> oh that one yeah, yeah. I, remember, I remember i didn't understand it very well then <laughs> but i do you do express yourself very clearly and concisely and yes you're a very professional teacher it was nice to it's nice to see you present before so i'm glad that you're joining us on the team and i'm glad to have quality content so so how did you move from witchcraft and kabbalah to dream work well uh it's not really a huge leap honestly um, I've always been interested in um, the nature of psyche and in dreams. I think I had my first dream journal when I was like seven or eight years old. Oh, wow. So I was a weird kid, <laughs> um, <laughs> like, like so many of us, just interested in, in stuff that was a little bit out of the box. Um, but uh, I got my training. Um, in witchcraft, um, and it was in a uh, Western mystery school um, that had a very much a focus on astrology and Kabbalah and Tarot. So it was kind of leaning towards ceremonial magic rather than your typical pagan Wicca. Um, so that was my background to begin with. And I decided that at some point that I wanted to go back to school um, mm -hmm. because the reason I had gotten into um, clergy to begin with was because I wanted to help people. Mm -hmm. And I really saw that mentoring people, they were making major changes in their lives through just having support, um, having some mentoring and having ritual in their mm -hmm. life to be able to change the pieces of their selves that, you know, they needed to work on. Um, I mean, that's what the great work is. Right. Um, is really becoming your full potential in the world. I couldn't um, agree more. <laughs> you know, yeah. I mean, it's hundred percent what, what we're trying to do. Yeah. So I decided I wanted to kind of raise the bar for myself and take it to a place of higher education. Um, so I went back to school um, to get my master's degree in art therapy. Mm -hmm. um, I had had a background in art already. So it, it just seemed like the logical next step. 
Um, and I've also trained at this point with a Jungian school called the Assisi Institute um, that right. works mainly with dreams and archetypes. Yeah, I think um, I, the name sounds familiar. I, 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 my dream research or some research I must have come across it somewhere. Yeah, they're, they're pretty much in the forefront of um, <laughs> dream analysis and archetypal pattern analysis and the, the idea of archetypal field theory. So um, Jung was kind of an integral thinker, you know, a very much a mystic. Um, he was wondering about astrology and Kabbalah and Tarot and just the the nature of the human existence. Um, he got very involved in alchemy at the end of his career. So, you know, there, there's, there's a bridge there yeah. between, you know, some of the occult training I did and then the psychology training as, you know, saying what is the human mind and what is human consciousness? Yeah, we, um, we got a copy of the Red Book uh, a while ago, and it is just so beautiful. And I, I had never realized how much of a magician he was until I heard the story of how that that book was produced. And 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 when you look at it, it very much is a a spirit journal. It's it's a spirit book. Like if if I were going to go off in the mountains and and chart out the parts of my psyche that I wanted to work with ritually, it would look a lot like the red book i think at the end of the day it was it's just a beautiful work of of a magical mind i thought it was it was very surprising because i thought young I, all i knew is i i didn't know much i'll, I'll just leave it at that <laughs> i i think i know a lot more than i do but definitely not much about him yeah so. and he was through his entire career trying to uh maintain his legitimacy in the scientific community as well so mm -hmm. he was very hesitant to talk directly about his mystical experiences right? because um, he didn't want to mess that up. And that's why the Red Book was kind of obscured and locked away for so long. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think now I, I, it seems like we've moved on as a culture a little bit and, and his mystic uh, pursuits would be actually adding to his reputation at this point a little bit rather than detracting. So what 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 is dream work how how does a how would somebody who's a magician work with um dream work to like like what what do you do with dream work okay um well the first thing would be to start writing your dreams down um mm -hmm. so journaling yes and actively having consciousness that you are open to the dream maker um which is basically what we call the are uh, the part of our psyche that you know generates dreams um uh, I, I that reminds me i have a question about that okay <laughs> but yeah uh, so i have i have a theory that when we're going to sleep the subconscious mind starts just chattering and i like to think that as i'm falling asleep i hear that little voice come out a little bit louder and a little bit louder and then it becomes the dream sort of but i, I don't really know exactly if that's true it's just been my experience and it sort of the dreams either are replaying events that happen during the day in symbolic ways, or my dreams are um, just like a running commentary on just th that that background chatter that's going on in the back of your mind. I don't know if other people have that or if I just hear voices. I, I'm not sure. But um, yeah, yeah, it's just it sounds like there's something in the back of your head just going all the time. And as you fall asleep, it sort of takes over. Is that is there any science behind that that would that would support that. I mean, what, what happens when people fall asleep and, and drift into dreams? Well, um, for some people it's different. Um, yes, everybody has that background chatter. I mean, oh, thank God. you know, <laughs> th th thoughts are like a stream that kind of flows through, you know, like, and they go on and on and on. Um, and the idea is who we are is that which is observing the thoughts, not the thoughts themselves. And, you know, our emotions as they come and go, like, you know, tides and thoughts are the same way. It kind of just comes and goes. Uh, Jung would say that there's a bunch of different pieces of that, that yes, there would be a part of it that is just about um, filing our, um, our memories and what we've learned and trying to integrate things throughout the day um, on just a very practical level. And then 
there is like, it's like your home base is your personal unconscious. And that's kind of like how you've learned things, um, like your internal programming, all of those pieces kind of like working together, um, mm -hmm. processes running in the background. Um, but there's an, another piece above that that he called the collective unconscious. So that's the, you know, if, if we had a personal bubble and everybody has their own little personal bubbles kind of, we all kind of interact together. Like you and I have like a bipersonal field right now of how we're interacting. Mm -hmm. So there's both information and energy as an exchange. Right. Um, so when you think about all of humanity, that forms like the human collective bubble. Um, and when we are asleep, we are connected to our internal personal part as well as the collective. So when we have these like kind of big dreams that like really shake up everything where you wake up and you're like, whoa, what mm -hmm. was that? Like, that's when you know, like you've been touched by something that is beyond your mundane, like, you know, I ate too much cheese before I went to bed, you know, like that kind of like piece of it where it like feels like it has like almost a substance to it, um, mm -hmm. that the, the vibration is stronger. Um, you know, it's like, it's, I'm, I'm trying to describe this very ephemeral experience. <laughs> um, but yeah, when it seems to have more power and weight and it seems to be more alive, mm -hmm. that's when we've connected to something larger. Um, okay. And it could be other people that we've connected to. It could be our ancestral line. It could be, you know, when we're dealing with elections, there's a lot of collective energy all focused on certain things like, you know, the collective energy of the U.S. as we were, you know. Oh, my God. Yeah. Right. Uh, part like of the election. <laughs> yes, we were all in turmoil. Right. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that. Um, my teacher, Michael Conforti, saw was um, in 2016, before the election, there were people, he said, like, 90% of his clients were dreaming about Trump as president. Oh, yeah. It was already in the collective consciousness that that was going to happen. Yeah, it was awful, wasn't it? <laughs> we knew, though. We knew what we knew what we were getting into. But... Yeah. Yeah. So, um, is that how? So, like in the Greek magical papyri, there are these rituals for getting dream oracles that are supposed to answer questions that you have about things. Is, would that explain how that um, sort of th does the model of the universal archetypes? Yes. Collective unconscious. Um, and my um, my relationship to the idea of archetypes is it's not all in your head. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's something that kind of gets glossed over um, in the world of psychology of saying that, you know, it's like these like everyone has a mother complex and everybody has a father complex because we've all been birthed by mothers and fathers. Right. So it's innate within us. And there is something that is larger that's connected to all of us. Because mm -hmm. like when you go into parenthood, you cross a threshold into the archetypal field of parenting. And right. it's not something that you understand intellectually. It like you actually move through it. So, right. so the what the Greeks were talking about do work with this of saying, you know, we're trying to open ourselves up to seeing how do we get information that we aren't consciously aware of that's either in our personal unconscious or in the larger world. So yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. One of the classes you're teaching is on the uh, the genius. Mm -hmm. and the the role of the genius spirit in, in that. I'm, I'm super looking forward to seeing the materials that you're going to be coming up with. So that, that yeah. creativity uh, spirit, that intellect of, yeah. Anyway, I, it, I'm excited to, to, if you can't tell, so. Yeah, yeah, that's that's one of those subjects. I don't want us to like get onto that yet right. because Not like, yet. Another... you know, I'm writing a thesis about it that'll probably be a book and I'm like, <laughs> once i get started on it i can't stop i so. gotcha yeah, yeah. Well, that'll be the that'll be the another conversation we have so, okay all right so february 27th we're gonna start and it's gonna be at four o'clock 28th 28th thank you i keep saying the 27th don't i i'm gonna have to go back and edit that i'm sure <laughs> but
but yes, the 28th, February 28th at 4 p.m. So we're going to do it at 4 p.m. Eastern so that it spreads out to noon uh, by the Pacific time so that the states can have a, as big of a range as possible because unfortunately the states still remain our primary um, uh, market. So okay, got to cater to them. But um, our friends in Europe and uh, Guam and Korea are welcome to join us. They just have to rearrange their schedules a little bit. <laughs> Yeah. So, yeah. Um, yeah. So is there anything else that you wanted to talk about with that or? Um, sure. Um, there will be some practical advice um, with the, the dream class where we're going to talk about um, starting to look at how do you look at different pieces of dreams um, on a, in a scientific way um, rather than just like this means this like dream dictionaries kind of say. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to give some uh, tips on how do you start your own dream practice. Um, so this is this a dream practice. Is there a way to do, do you uh, I don't even know if this is possible to to actively I mean do you get into like lucid dreaming or actively participating in your dreams or is that something that's a different um, there are some ways that people talk about, uh, dreaming the dream forward, um, and kind of like looking for clues in your life that kind of relate to the dream to get more information from the dream. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I, for me personally, I haven't done much that I thought was useful with lucid dreaming. Um, right. It's I find fun. that like, yeah, exactly. The times <laughs> where I, I realize I'm dreaming, I don't use my powers for good. So, you know, it's kind of like a total waste. And I was like, well, that was self-indulgent. Okay. <laughs> well, I you mean, know. that's, that's also a different kind of good though. Let's be, let's be fair to ourselves. We deserve that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I just, uh, you know, like there would be useful ways of saying, you know, like I'm being chased in a dream and then I realize I'm dreaming. I turn around to face the dream and find out what it wants. Like that would be very useful, but I don't realize I'm dreaming in dreams like that. Right. When I realize so, I'm dreaming, I'm just like, oh, okay then. Let's fly. <laughs> right. Exactly. First thing. Oh, I can fly again. Hey. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Guilty. Guilty as charged. Yeah. So. Yeah. So, I mean... You know, there, there are plenty of people that that think, you know, lucid dreaming is like amazing and they do a lot of work in that. The work mm -hmm. that I've done for the most part is looking at the dreams when you're awake. Um, yeah, it seems like that's more meaningful and more useful um, and more uh, more likely to be repeatable. <laughs> you know, I mean, the, the lucid dreaming, there's a lot of techniques for getting into it and out of it, but it's it's still catch as catch can, but every night that you dream and remember your dreams, you can perform some form of analysis and understand what's going on. And once you get trained for that, the, I think that'll make those PGM rights a lot more effective too, when people are actually used to recording their dreams and used to remembering them. Because I know that when I, when I do conjure work with spirits and I ask them to send me dreams about things, I often uh, forget them because I don't, I'm not in the, I'm not in the habit of writing them down and I'll wake up and I'll be like, Oh, that's what that meant. And, you know, sometimes I'm lucky enough to remember that, that I got an answer and what the answer was, but I lose all the detail around it. And it's like, I know that in the moment when I'm dreaming it, it's full of, of all these symbols and all the stuff that would be really great to understand if I could remember it later. But yeah, I, I lose all, I lose all the little details. Hey, um, quick question, totally okay. unrelated. Uh, well, not totally, but the in in dreams when you have the the backdrop of like a post apocalyptic thing, like where everything is sort of dirty and messy, and what how would like I know that that's a common theme for a lot of people's dreams, and I have those dreams probably three out of five nights a week, you know, where where the background is just all trashed. Is that what, what does that represent besides like, I, it's easy for me to say, oh, my life is a mess <laughs> and it's going into my dreams. Is that, is that well, all it is? Or? Well, let, let's look at what the meaning of apocalypse means. Does mm -hmm. it mean like in times? Is it like after a disaster? Well, um, I think, I think in common parlance, maybe it's after a disaster, but I don't, I don't know. What, what do you think it means? It's, 
Yeah, I mean, that, that would be the important piece of it is, you know, are we talking about an actual, like, you know, and, and everybody does have those kind of dreams. Um, mm -hmm. And I think, you know, that's one of those, like, what happens after the tower falls? Um, oh, yeah. You know, then you're walking around the rubble and deciding how to rebuild. Um, so that could be from a personal level. Um, and sometimes it is also from cultural shifts, um, you know, and then we're asking like, is the dream in context appropriate or is it, you know, blown way out of proportion for context mm -hmm. of like, you're acting like this is apoc an apocalypse, but your actual situation is much more secure than you think it is. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's a lot like everything else when you're feeling uh, overwhelmed, you have to reframe it and sort of take a, take, take a step back and try to get to the 10,000 foot view at least. Or, yeah. The perfect you know. example is something that like that right now is um, people having any dreams about doing things in large crowds. Uh -huh, because like right, right now, like um, having a dream that you're at a bar or having a dream that you're at a concert um, or in a conference. Um, that's not over zoom. Um, <laughs> it's saying you, we've set up a situation that cannot exist oh, okay. or should not exist. Right. I mean, maybe there are, you know, underground parties going on, but should we go to, should anybody be going to any of them? Right. Absolutely not. Yeah. Wear your masks and do your things right. Right. So. Right. So, you know, that's, you, you can't pretend it's not, it's not happening in the dream because that's the collective reality we're living in. That's interesting. I never thought about that because I, I haven't had any of those dreams myself, but I, I, I might think that I, like, yeah, I, it's funny that that would become a scare or a, a this, an indicator that it's not right. You know, the, the not a jump scare, but you know, yeah, that's yeah, fascinating. exactly. It's saying you're setting up a situation that cannot be. So, um, so this is the kind of thing that you're that the class will help us to understand how to frame and and just walk away with a better understanding of what the richness of dreams brings to our lives and stuff like yes, that. Yes, yes. Um, I am going to give the caveat for the dream that I don't want anybody to share their personal dreams. Mm -hmm. um, it's too personal. Um, it's um, it, it's just too personal to be able to share in a classroom setting. Mm -hmm. um, because you wind up like, you know, you may be sharing your like worst trauma to the group. And then like, you know, if I understand what that pattern is saying, then you had no idea that, you know, not something you would ever share with a group of people. So like, right. we don't, can't. we don't go there in <laughs> group settings. It's not safe. <laughs> no, exactly. Exactly. Right. So, well, I'm glad that your class will be a safe space. Yeah. Yeah. Those, those are important. All right. Well, thank you for your time. I appreciate the interview. Um, I'm looking forward to doing the uh, participating in the class as much as I can. Um, and again, it was February 28th at 4 p.m. Yes. Eastern. Okay. All right. Cool. Yes. Thanks a lot. And it's a 90 minute class, right? Yes, so, it is. And, and just... you know, and we'll be open for questions after that. So cool. Yeah. yeah. All right. And it's good. Um, it's really good to see you again and, and be back involved with with the current that is Maggie. <laughs> so, all right. Thanks um, for having me along. Yeah, thank you.